Okay. Hello and welcome. Dr. Patrick Shojai, the Urban Monk, here doing a special roundtable discussion with uh, some very interesting people who do things that I didn't even know were done <laughs> until a while ago. And now it's becoming one of my uh, favorite topics. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the soil, specifically about life and carbon sequestration into the soil and what that means for the planet. There's some really interesting promise here and um, this thing has really warranted uh, beyond uh, you know, a couple interviews, a round table discussion. We're, we're throwing a lot of cameras at this in this upcoming year. Uh, it's a big deal and uh, there's a lot of promise here. So with me, um, I have, and I'll just introduce everybody and then we'll come in and just say hi and I'll call you all in uh, and go. I'm just going to go off my list. So we have Jimmy Sinton, who's the CEO of the Fair Carbon Exchange. Molly Havilland, who is a soil conservationist, and this is my favorite word, a micro herder with uh, Havilland Earth Regeneration. Dr. Elaine Ingham, who's a world renowned soil biologist uh, and founder of uh, Soil Food Web Inc. And Ryland Engelhart, who's a soil activist and the co founder of Kiss the Ground, owner of uh, Cafe Gratitude in LA. Uh, and he's also hanging out with us from Paris right now. He is at the climate conference. So we got a, we got a man on the beat out there. So this is this is great. I want to welcome you all and um, thank you for your time. Uh, I know you all are busy, and uh, this is this is an important subject that um, I think warrants a lot of attention, as I said. So I'm actually going to start with Ryland because he's uh, he's out there right now in Paris, and there's been some uh, some news about carbon sequestration that the uh, Minister of France has just kind of thrown a gauntlet on. Uh, and this is really good news. So can you share with us what's happening there real quick? Absolutely. Thank you so much for uh, having us on. Uh, yeah, it's, it's fun to be here in Paris and to be coming back to my country and uh, sharing the, some of the good news that we've experienced out here. So yeah, the Minister of Agriculture, the kind of highest person on the totem pole of agriculture of France, has uh, made a big declaration on December 1st uh, stating that one of their primary tenets or uh, focuses for addressing climate change uh, is through building soil carbon by ex um, sequestering it out of the atmosphere uh, and putting it back into the soil through photosynthesis. And uh, they're, they're going to do this by 0.4% per year on all their cultivated land. And they, they proposed this. Uh, it's an internationally binding agreement. And I think 24 countries currently have already signed on to this agreement, uh, including, I know, uh, Australia and the UK for sure. And it really is the, I mean, from the perspective that I've heard a lot of people talk about out here, which is if, if the COP21, if all the big, um, if all the big boys sign the agreements in the best case scenario, the reduction of um, fossil uh, emissions still over the next five years is going to have us increase temperature to 3.5 degrees. And for those people who understand that, that will cause a lot of chaos and more destruction on the planet, more than we can even imagine. So really the best case reduction plan is not really good enough. And so the fact that there is this um, potential of uh, carbon sequestration through soil management and uh, land stewardship and that the French government, the place that's hosting this event, has put a stake in the ground and said this is what we're doing, this is the blind spot, this is what we need to do to make this happen and that 24 countries have signed on is really miraculous. I, I'm this is blown huge. away. Yeah, I mean, I learned, I learned this information three years ago and I've pretty much spent every waking day since that three day, three years ago to communicate and tell and inform and inspire people about this message and to get to come out here at this time when this is happening it's just it's miraculous really it really is so let's uh, let's jump back real quick and uh, dr. Elaine what are we talking about here when we're talking about sequestering carbon we all know that carbon's a problem, right? We got too much of it in the atmosphere. We've been, you know, burning uh, fossil fuels and uh, extracting carbon from underground and putting it uh, above in our atmosphere, and that's causing all kinds of problems. Uh, I'll actually share a little video that uh, um, we have uh, that Ryland has done that was really cool uh, on this subject. But Dr. Elaine, um, I want to get into the science a little bit and just 
have us understand that this isn't pseudoscience. This is something that has been well established, and now you know heads of state are getting behind this. What's the promise here? The promise is that if we put the proper biology back into the soil, in all of our agricultural soils, all of our landscapes, lawns, gardens, every piece of land that plants can grow on, we need to make certain that this biology is present in the soil because as that photosynthate comes from above ground and goes down into the root systems, we need to be sequestering and holding on to um, as much of that carbon as we possibly can. We need to build soil. It's absolutely not true that it takes a hundred years to build an inch of soil. If we make the proper compost, if we take all of our food waste, and let the proper biology work on it in an aerobic fashion. We will build the humic acids, the fulvics, all of those carbon compounds that have very long life um, sorry, lifetimes in the soil. Uh, we could sequester most of that um, carbon in the soil instead of letting it be um, uh, evolved back into the atmosphere as greenhouse gases or carbon dioxide reasonably, if we got everybody working on this, if everyone made compost from their waste materials, if we made sure all uh, the industrial wastes were properly composed, composted and then that compost put on soil and maintain plant cover on all of that soil, we could reasonably take all of the elevated CO2 in the atmosphere and put it back into the soil, store it in the soil in a three-year period of time. Now this would take wow. global effort in order to do that. Every place has to work on this. So you know, if we don't get everybody signed on, um, it could take five years, ten years, but we know how to do this. It can be done. We just have to implement the will to do that. Okay, so just, just so I can understand this and get real clear on this, what we're talking about is taking biological waste and creating compost so that we can have a top layer um, so that there can be that carbon back in the soil but also life kind of building in the soil because we have two, two kind of separate issues. One is carbon in the atmosphere, the other one is depleted topsoil and so our, our actual uh, soil is more like dirt and it's inert and it doesn't have the life and our, and our produce isn't doing well. Uh, is, that, is that kind of a, it's, it's pretty top down, but is that, a, is that a decent summation of what we're talking about here? Yeah, but we want to do more than just get this good biology and sequestered carbon in a surface layer. We've got to get that moving down as deep as we possibly can with microorganisms in the soil doing their job of building aggregate structure. We can get the roots of our plants going much, much deeper. So for example, most people only think tree roots can go down about three feet and then they go sideways. And that is totally just an artifact of the damage that we've been doing to our soil, turning it into dirt. Once we break, once we get um, the microorganisms down into that soil, break up the compaction layers, the root systems of our trees should be going down 100, 150, 250 feet down into the soil, which means we can sequester carbon all the way through that root system. Crop plants, the grasses in your lawn, those root systems should be going down 10, 15, 25 feet. And that means we can sequester carbon in all of that depth, not just the top six inches or foot. We have all of that potential storage place. And of course, that's where a lot of the CO2 in our atmosphere originally came from. As we started to till our soils and destroy the life and we could no longer sequester that carbon, we no longer had the nutrient cycling that these organisms do in natural systems. You know, nobody's out there in that old growth forest putting on inorganic fertilizers or pesticides. So how can those trees continue to sequester on an annual basis more nutrients than any agricultural field on the planet's surface? They're sequestering and pulling it in, so how can they stay alive? Obviously, the chemical world doesn't really understand how soil works. And so if we reduce the tillage, if we stop tilling, can we still produce the food? Yes. We can increase yields in our agricultural systems. We can increase the nutrient content in our um, plant materials. That's already been done. It's in the scientific literature. It is not a question of you've got all this research that has to be done to prove your point of view. It's well documented in the scientific literature. 
So Molly was just out here in my studio in Southern California, and she's going to help me with uh, doing a soil analysis of my garden, figuring out what's there, because uh, just this delicious layer of life that's there to support our life um, is something that she's been working on. And Molly, you've been on the beat. You've gone to farms around the world and helped increase yield. Um, very much so and increase the quality of produce with what you've done. And Elaine, I know you do this too, but Molly, I'd, I'd like for you to chime in on this quickly. Well, <clears throat> really the work that I've started doing on large-scale farms has um, started rolling out last year. Um, so Dr. Ingham is much, well ver that much better versed in um, increased yield production and nutrient content in foods. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me, but my farmers are um, noticing changes, reduction in weediness. You know, weeds in large-scale agriculture um, are the the invitation for herbicide application, and now we have these herbicide-resistant plants that are developing. I mean, how intelligent is nature that it can change and respond to what we put onto it? It changes and responds so quickly that it be can become resilient to it. So why aren't we able to recognize that this is actually a tool that we can use to our benefit? If weeds are going to grow on bare soil, then uh, why don't we just choose the plants that we would rather be there, along with our corn, along with our soy? Um, let's choose plants that are going to keep the soil in place and keep it covered and feed the below ground microorganisms releasing what we call exudates or what Dr. Ingham calls the cakes and the cookies into the soil. This is food for microbiology. And when one bacterium becomes two in 20 minutes and one teaspoon of soil is full of billions and trillions of bacteria, I mean, we have, we have so much potential to utilize a tool of living soil uh, to increase health not only for um, ourselves, but for uh, our quality of water, our quality of air, our quality of food, our quality of life. How do you, f how do I recommend that if there are people that are watching this that haven't ever been in an in a agricultural field that practices what we call monocropping, right? One kind of plant grown. I recommend doing that. And, and then go and walk into a forest and, and stand in a forest and, and notice when you're in these places, notice the air quality. Notice the way that your footsteps fall on the ground. What different kind of environment is there? Um, life requires diversity for resiliency. And we've been really good at isolating component parts. So we know a lot about specific things. Now we have a great opportunity to combine all of these individual understandings of knowledge that we have and use it as a consortium together. It will be much more powerful. Well, it sounds like there's a, there's, it's, it's so like micro macro here. So we have this micro promise of bringing life back into the soil and helping us eat. And then we have this uh, fair carbon exchange, which is this global idea of transforming this climate change that we have through this very play. And so Jimmy, I'd love for you to talk to us about what you're doing there, what the promise of a fair carbon exchange is, and how this thing could roll out. <clears throat> yes, indeed. It actually can roll out very fast. Um, we started our, our fair carbon exchange about a year ago, uh, but less than a year ago. And we already have a, a large company in South Africa who recognized the potential of this. They're a retailer multi-billion dollar retailer who uh, have a thousand farmers who supply their stores and they've got a program which encourages the farmers to farm sustainably and it's been incredibly successful they're now incorporating the measurement of carbon with the potential for these farmers to get paid extra and certainly to get any training and conversion costs covered by corporate entities that want to be carbon neutral. And so that's what we're working on right now. We have been in touch with a number of large corporations who already spend 
tens of millions of dollars buying carbon offsets because they want to be carbon neutral. Example would be Disney, um, Microsoft, Apple, and these corporations only need the evidence that, that this works and they will be switching funds into this channel. So now the question is where's the evidence because it sounds like I just read about this in the Washington Post uh, there are uh, there's a lot of conversation happening around this so the science I'm gonna go back to Elaine on this one the science on this um, seems to be pretty sound so you know how, how close are we to saying hey listen this thing is this thing is here and let's go it's um, we're, we're working with people around the world on these kinds of questions, uh, showing them, Molly uh, doing the work with people in the field, bringing them along, sequestering carbon, improving the quality of the soil, reducing erosion, improving water quality, so everything she was talking about. We are doing this with millions of acres around the world. And so it's not really a question of if we can do it, it's um, how do we get people to understand that they need to join with and start doing this themselves on their lawns, in their gardens, in their agricultural mm -hmm. fields, in their orchards. Every place we grow a plant, we need to be applying this kind of technology. So for my home garden, I can start applying this immediately, and I could do my I could be a little drip in the in the ocean here. Um, and then with large agriculture. Um, the signatories on this thing, um, you know, I wanted I want to point out that the United States did not show up to this party in Paris, and um, uh, Ryland had talked about a couple other countries who didn't, Brazil, and, um, Argentina, and these are the countries that have the largest footprint of GMO monocrops. So, what makes it um, difficult when you're dealing with chemicals, pesticides, and GMO monocrops? What makes it difficult to do the right thing here, Elaine? I'll start. I'll, I'll stay with you, and then we'll kind of go go to other guests now that we're now that we're still here. Okay. the The biggest problem is that those large chemical companies, te biotech industry, they have so much hold on our universities, on the educational system. Um, they make billions, trillions of dollars on an annual basis, and it's hard to fight that kind of entrenched, invested um, machinery. We've got to convince people that uh, they, they need to not be buying those products. They need to start making their own compost or buying local compost from somebody who is doing it the right way. So um, we've got a, a big industry against us. I mean, think of the tobacco companies. Think of that kind of fight that has to be fought here to get people to listen and change what they're doing and understand that what's brought us to this place where we've got global climate change, we've got massive difficulties with water quality, we're destroying our soil, um, is because uh, we've gone down that pathway of the Green Revolution, basically. Uh, so, Jimmy, you're dealing with trying to change this on a macro scale, um, and uh, economics are really kind of playing uh, to your hand here. Uh, you know, with Al Gore and all this kind of stuff that came up in the last decade with carbon exchange and swaps and all that, you know, there's a lot of skepticism because they thought that people were just kind of passing the buck. Uh, with this, there seems to be a promise that is incredibly interesting uh, that basically drives people to go back to a, another global need, which is feeding the world while simultaneously sequestering carbon. So I'd love to hear uh, what kind of promise there is in there. Right. Well, in fact, um, we are working on a plan to pull together all the parties who are involved in this kind of regenerative agriculture, uh, as well as people in the large retail sector because what happened in South Africa is a great model for what we can do in the United States and many other countries. What they did was come up with a program, the, this is the retailer, which all their farmers are obliged to sign on to and they get measured. And depending on how good their agriculture is, they can get a certified stamp 
on their food, which turns out to be very high quality food. And so the consumers wanted this so much that their stores did so well that they went out and purchased a larger number of stores in Australia. So this is, this is a good model. Um, in other words, the consumer wants this. And this is South Africa where if you talk about climate change, people will look at you a little bit strangely because nobody talks about climate change in South Africa um, except a few knowledgeable people. So if they can do that in South Africa, we can certainly do it in the United States. And we, we have a group uh, who are putting together a um, proposal as we speak now to actually get this started in the United States. Fantastic. Uh, Ryland, you're out there lobbying and uh, on, really on behalf of all of us in Paris. Uh, how many people have kind of turned the corner and are seeing this? Because to me, this sounds so damn promising, right? It's it's such an incredible way of kind of handling more than just two birds with one stone. Um, is there a certain degree of enthusiasm that you're seeing bubbling up there with the delegate with the delegations in Paris? And how much of this is really starting to come uh, front and center? Uh, I would say, you know. In Paris, this is my first time to Paris, my first cop, uh, and what I didn't realize is there's kind of like, there's a blue zone, which is where all the delegates kind of meet and kind of the official heads of countries, you know, negotiate and hopefully deals and uh, agreements get made, and no uh, civilians or public people can kind of enter that. And then there's many other... Uh, side venues happening with you know a lot of NGOs and um, you know and that's kind of where I've been um, participating and what I have noticed and what I can authentically say is that uh, what many people have told me that I've come across is the one new conversation that has a lot of excitement um, that's shown up in a lot of uh, people's uh, in a lot of conferences and a lot of people's c communications is this aspect and this potential of soil and carbon sequestration through proper land management. So what I can say is that it it absolutely three years ago I felt like I would bring this up and I was speaking into a vacuum. <laughs> no one, I mean, you know, no one it felt. I mean, of course, Elaine Ingham and these guys, but not anybody in like the in public, you know, intelligent people in all cities around the world, no one knew had any idea about this. Um, and so sure. my, my experience is that this conversation has gone from, you know, a, a friend, not, not a real conversation to a real, I mean, some of the biggest events, again, not the blue zone kind of uh, diplomat events, but some of the biggest events that happened in Paris around uh, climate change from the front of the stage, multiple speakers were communicating the potential of soil. I mean, Naomi Klein was talking about it. Of course, Vandana Shiva was talking about it. Uh, even Bill McGibbons, who hasn't wanted to talk about it because he's fighting another fight, which we want him to fight his, you know, it's, we, he, we appreciate his efforts. Um, but obviously, there's this other component that needs to be engaged simultaneously as the work that he's doing, which is, you know, um, going up against, you know, fossil, you know, the fo burning of fossil fuels. Um, so, you know, people who weren't talking about this a year ago, two years ago, are bringing it into the conversation because they get, even if it's not their primary agenda, it actually needs, it's essential for it to be uh, deployed simultaneously or we don't have any hope. And so sure. that's, that's what I've noticed. So this is multifaceted, obviously. Uh, Molly, what are the stumbling blocks that we are facing here. Why is this not happening everywhere? Like I'm, I'm going out and composting next week. You know what I mean? Like I, I drank the Kool-Aid. This is so interesting. This is so amazing. I want all my neighbors doing it. Uh, you know, I'm going to keep talking about this because it, it makes sense. Uh, what do we need to do to get this thing deployed out on the grassroots? I think that there needs to be a paradigm shift. There needs to be a recognition of this is a time where we need to start paying attention to quality versus quantity. When we're looking at quantity, it doesn't matter what state it's in just as long as we have enough of it, right? 
But where in nature is there anything that exists, or even in, in your garage, right, or on a farm or anywhere, where is there anything that exists that doesn't require some kind of input? So essentially what we've been doing is we've been going to the soil, Mother Nature's cupboards, and we've been taking and taking and taking and taking and we go back and we realize there's not much more to take so then we end up taking out the cupboards, right? So now we have a lot of work to do by putting back in the cupboards and filling in the ingredients and not everybody wants to make compost and that's okay. But there are a lot of people that do. And so if you want to make compost, that's great. There's lots of resources that you can um, uh, check out for you to be able to do that and, and start small scale. Or you can also begin communicating with people in your neighborhood. Maybe there's a CSA that does composting that you get your um, community-supported agricultural produce from, and you can bring back your kitchen waste to that farm so that they can cycle it back into the soil. Or maybe there's a municipal composting operation that's doing this. So you can make sure that you're plugging into that aspect as well. Um, but I think it's uh, at, at, a, at a consumer level, it's really important to understand where your food is coming from. Let's think about this for a moment. Animals used to be out on the land. And when animals are out on the land and they're eating, they're also pooping. And their poop is an incredibly valuable product. Microorganisms are big fans of animal manure. Well, we've taken our animals off of the land and we put them into giant buildings and we feed them things that they don't normally eat, like we feed cows corn. There's an ethanol plant in Iowa, actually, that will feed the cattle the ethanol waste, the corn waste, we, um, for my university, we had the opportunity to come and meet these gentlemen and we asked them why they didn't want to feed their cattle grass. And they said, cows don't eat grass. <laughs> so this is a paradigm shift that has to take place. We have to look at what ecosystem services that life offers. It's invaluable. We, we try to put a price on it and, you know, we have to pay attention because, you know, economy and all of this. But... Um, we took these animals that had an incredible, valuable resource for soil health. We started feeding them things that they couldn't digest, and so now we're feeding them hormones and, and antibiotics. And so now we've taken their animal waste, and we've actually made it very toxic to put back out onto the land. Yep. So as a consumer, you need to be asking questions. Where are these, what are these animals eating? Where do they live? Go check out the farm. Talk to your farmer's market uh, individuals. Ask them two key questions. How do you fertilize your food? What's your fertility management program? And how do you address weeds and pests in your garden? And if their answers make sense to you and settle in right, then great, support them in that. Vote with your dollar. That's very important to do. So that's that's huge, and I want to uh, emphasize this because in uh, something that you actually taught me, and I want to, you know, I'll actually move this to Elaine just to keep things moving around here. Is the big three, the big three? That's what is used for fertilizer. And even if you're an organic farm, it's what is it? Uh, with nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. You tell me. But that's all you got to put in there to qualify as an organic farm, but what about selenium? What about copper? What about zinc? What about all the other good stuff that used to be in the soil that's not getting there? So what does healthy soil look like, and how does that support healthy plants? Well, in fact, all of those nutrients actually are in your soil. It's not that we've lost them. What we've lost is the ability to convert them from a plant not available form into a plant available form. And guess what it is that does that job in nature? Yeah, the microorganism. Yeah. You've got to have the bacteria, the fungi that make the enzymes to pull those nutrients out of the rocks, the pebbles, the sands, the silts, the clays, the organic matter, sequester them in their bodies. And then those bacteria and fungi have to be eaten by their predators, the protozoa, the nematodes, the microarthropods, the spiders, the, all those nice creatures in soil that eat bacteria and fungi. And that releases those nutrients back to the plant in a plant-available form. 
And if we kill those organisms, then you have to use the inorganic fertilizers. You're going to have pest problems. You're going to have uh, all the negatives that we're seeing in our agricultural systems, in our landscapes. So we have to put that biology back into the soil. So you know, we need to educate people that those nutrients are still in their soil. There is no soil on this planet that lacks the nutrients to grow plants. Maybe there's a few odd you know, places where we're you know, dealing with marine sands. Okay, there's a very small portion of the, uh, the planet that doesn't have soil on it. Everything else, we've got all the nutrients we need. All you have to do is put the biology back into the soil. And the okay, easiest I wanna, place... I want to get real clear on this because this is something that um, I think is, is really misunderstood in our space is when we're talking about depleted topsoil, when you're thinking like grapes of wrath and like dust bowls and all this kind of stuff, what is depleted isn't necessarily the nutrients. What you're saying is it's the life that can break up the uh, the inorganic matter so that then the organic matter can take it and pass it down down the chain of life here. Is that is that right. accurate? Yeah, we have to convert the nutrients that are in a crystalline structure within the rocks, the sands, the silts, the clays, those microorganisms, the bacteria, fungi, convert it into an organic form in their bodies. And then the predators uh, release those nutrients because they're in massive excess in your bacteria and fungi. They release those excess nutrients in a plant available form. That's how nature makes selenium available to your plant, cobalt zinc, boron, iron, not just nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. You know, we got to get off that, that the plants grow on NPK and that's all you need. Um, yeah. If you ask any plant physiologist, they will say, oh no, there are 42 essential elements that plants have to have in order to be able to grow. And every time we look at something else, we add it to the list because we realize all those nutrients are necessary. You lack any one. Well, how do you provide your plant with all of the nutrients in the proper balances? It's called life. It's called all of those organisms in the soil doing their proper job. So when you're really talking about soil, soil is not only the mineral component, the sand, silk, clays, rocks, pebbles, etc., but you have to have organic matter, where it, which is another form of storing carbon as well as those micronutrients, but you have to have the life that will cycle those nutrients properly, hold anything that's in excess, keep it in your soil so it doesn't volatilize off and end up in the atmosphere. This is fascinating. So in healthcare, we have this kind of persistent uh, conversation right now, and it's a big one. It's the microbiome. And talking about what happens when the microbiome is compromised, whether it's through GMOs or through antibiotics or, you know, myriad ways we're destroying the, the good guys inside of our own digestive tracts. Uh, and this is causing all kinds of health problems, and uh, there's also a, a renaissance in healthcare right now around this uh, for the same reason. And so a lot of good docs are prescribing microbiota. and. At the end of the day, it comes down to food. So, Ryland, you, you're actually the founder of Cafe Gratitude, which is an awesome place in L.A., which is all about organic food and what that brings into our lives again. So, when food is grown in good soil, then through those root nodules and through the life that interacts with the plants, then we're getting all this good stuff sucked up into the organic produce. So you are obviously careful about where you get. So how do you source your food for you know one of the most popular organic food restaurants uh, in LA, which probably makes it one of the most popular in the world? Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, just to be clear, I'm the I'm one of the owners. My father created it, so I've ah. uh, I'm second generation. I, I'm not going to say I'm the founder because he founded got it, it. Got it. My bad. Um, no, it's fine. Just to be clear. Um, and yeah, so yeah, we have five restaurants in the Bay in in the Southern California area. Uh, four Cafe Gratitudes and one Gracias Madre, which is an organic uh, vegan Mexican restaurant. And uh, yeah, it's a it, it's pretty amazing. We're serving sometimes as many as four thousand people a day. A hundred percent organic meals, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean we're we're blessed. Obviously, we're blessed to be in Southern California, where you can grow uh, high quality food. The sunlight and the weather permits to grow food year round, and um, you know we've 
we've established some great direct relationships um, with uh, many different uh, local farmers in Los Angeles, and then we work with a father and son um, produce distributor called Heath and Lejeune. Uh, uh, they actually used to be farmers, and now they're distributors of only organic produce, and right. um, they they actually are an amazing, amazing company. And we actually just did our free Thanksgiving. We do a free Thanksgiving every year. We serve about a thousand meals in a uh, four-hour period, and they donated all the food to us for that event. Um, amazing. Yeah. So I just uh, this is this is an interesting piece of this because as the consumer, which means you and I, like people who actually care about this, as the consumer starts to care more about the type of food that they eat and what's happening uh, in the supply chain of that, then you're demanding more organic food, which means you can then patronize um, uh, restaurants that buy from farms that are doing the right thing. So that has drawn this entire industry into uh, you know kind of better farming practices and all that and that's just because people like us want to eat good food and we don't want to eat poison and all that so that seems like a really uh, interesting way of hacking the supply chain to uh, reinforce better practices which I think is I think is phenomenal and it's, it's conscious capitalism at its best uh, Jimmy you're on the other side of this where it also makes sense to big businesses to sequester their carbon so as this two-pronged approach keeps growing, where do you see this going in terms of how we can start nudging the industry to make this happen faster? Right. I think, <clears throat> I think what's happening is you've already got Whole Foods starting to put pressure on their suppliers. They have a grading system to grade how sustainable their suppliers are. I think that trend is going to accelerate. Uh, I think you're going to see it emerging in a number of um, the major retailers. Uh, obviously, it's going to be the quality uh, conscious kind of customers that they're going after. So Walmart is not likely to be the top top one in that field. But uh, eventually, even Walmart, I sense, will, will go this way. And what's happening is consumer demand. And I've just studied the retail sector recently in the United States. In the last five years, there's been a massive shift from packaged goods to unpackaged goods in the retail sector. And that's a very positive sign. It shows that awareness is growing. Um, so our feeling is that we're going to see this happen via the consumer demand uh, translating through the retail outlets. And of course, when you're a farmer, you have to sell your produce. So if you're person purchasing it says I want it this way you'll you'll do it that way so we see that as the easiest way to transform the whole supply chain rather than trying to persuade um, you know legislation or, or those kind of approaches um, but we do obviously need also to address the needs of all all of the corporate sector who want to look good and minimize their carbon footprint they can do a lot, and they are, many of them, to minimize their carbon footprint by reducing inefficiencies, putting in solar, um, et cetera, those kind of things. But it's very hard to get to net zero. So what we offer them is a, uh, a, a temporary crutch, which they can use while they reduce their carbon footprint in, in reality. They can use this crutch just to help them stay net zero. So what does this look like? Way. What does this look like, Jimmy? Like, so I'm a, I'm a company. Uh, you know, we we're responsible for burning a lot of coal. We're trying to do the right thing. I come to you and say, Jimmy, help me. What do I do? I just put money into pra practices that'll uh, basically compost more. Like, how does it actually play out? Yeah. So yeah, you would you would uh, connect with a portfolio of farms um, who you would have connection with in terms of seeing what's happening. Um, you would get the public relations value of their change to more sustainable practice. And that would be measured and you would get that value because you're connected to a portfolio of farms. So it wouldn't just be that you're net zero and carbon, but also that you are channeling this money into the transformation of the food industry. Fantastic. 
Fantastic. It seems like an obvious approach, uh, you know, for conscious capital impact investors, and uh, you know, so that that seems to be one of the kind of big places to nudge this is to move big money into big transformation. And the promise, uh, from what Elaine is talking about, is just it seems almost too good to be true. But there's so much surface area that if we were to actually start grabbing carbon and pulling it down through the roots and shoots down into the soil. Uh, it could radically transform the face of our environmental crisis. Uh, you know, shoot, in the next three years, you said. So I got a question, and this might be a kind of a simple question, but uh, I, I need to know the answer to this. There's more than just carbon coming out of the tailpipes of our cars and the coal plants. So what about all the other crap? Like, does this help get the other stuff out? Do we not want that other stuff in the soil? Like all of the other kind of toxic carcinogens that are associated with burning petroleum. Uh, and this is a question for you specifically, Elaine. Uh, we're obviously sequestering carbon, uh, but what, do we have a solution for all the other stuff that's out there, or are we just going to deal with carbon for now and kind of uh, clean that up later? Um, no, because the, the joy of the diversity of microorganisms on this planet is that we already have organisms that can do all of these jobs. And as you make compost, you get this massive diversity of the local organisms that can perform all of these functions. So whether we're talking about hydrogen sulfide or we're talking about um, you know, the other greenhouse gases, methane, we can deal with all of those problems. As long as we keep the composting aerobic so that we can put that compost onto our soil, build soil. So now we've got that ability in our soils. Anytime somebody sprays something toxic, heavy metals, um, different kinds of uh, toxins, um, those materials will all be sequestered and converted into organic matter or organisms, and they become non-toxic. And I did want to make one point about something you were talking with Ryland about uh, the microbiome in the human gut. Where do the organisms come from that colonize your digestive system? Well, it's from the surface of the plants, and all of your plants have to be covered with all these really beneficial organisms so you get that benefit into your digestive system. If we're killing all those organisms, both on the surfaces of our plants and in our soils, turning it into dirt, then where are you going to get these microorganisms to benefit you? So what, we have to inject everybody with some one human being's good fecal um, sets of microorganisms? Or do you eat the food in, that's healthy that Ryland is offering in his, in his restaurants where you can reestablish that correct microflora so you can stay healthy? So uh, I have a follow-up question to that because this is really near and dear to my heart is what if we are being subjected to chemicals that say Monsanto has put on the food and say, oh, it's not Agent Orange, it's the other one. What was that roundup, right? And, and it's just all this nasty stuff that, that the food is being subjected to. What happens when roundup... Um, produce that's been exposed to Roundup then ends up in a compost bin. Does that really start changing the math or is there enough life to overwhelm that? We have to have enough life and the food to feed that life, the organic matter. So compost pile, huge, well it should be all organic matter. There's the energy to decompose the glyphosate. Glyphosate is a bacterial food and so we will get very rapid decomposition of all of these toxic chemicals if we have the right organisms and we have enough organic matter. So lots of work going on in the, um, in the academic world trying to isolate all, all the individual different species, turn it into a product that you sell, and you don't really have to do that. You just have to make the compost. So, so I have a question have a on question. that. Sorry, we're getting a little Sorry, echo. A little Let's just echo. mute everyone real quick everyone and come back, in. come back in. Welcome to Live Welcome Hangouts. To live Hangouts. Uh, one second. We'll wait for Lorenzo to do this. Okay. Um, okay. My echo is gone. So my question to that is there seems to be a very strong drive by industry. Um, uh, these, these big kind of chemical conglomerates that are producing more and more products that they need our farmers to buy uh, in order to keep doing what they, you know, they do because they forgot what their grandparents did, you know, a generation ago. Uh, and that 
economic trend is driving the industry towards more and more chemicals. And a lot of this just seems like kind of sane solutions that don't require that much capital investment so it doesn't drive the kind of agribusiness machine. So um, Jimmy, I'll come to you on this one. What do you think we need to do to get beyond this roadblock and bring some sense back to just bringing some natural practices to our farming and getting uh, companies and countries to just stop falling for this and helping support natural ag? Right. Well, there, there are two things. As I said, I think the one is to get retailers to be sensitive to their consumers and actually start putting policies in place with their supply chain. I think that's a very important one. I think the other one is to utilize the flow of cash, which is going to be enormous because coming out of this uh, Paris conference, there's certainly going to be some recommended minimums for the price of carbon. And uh, I know that the World Bank is already fixed on $35 a ton of carbon dioxide, which you know would translate to an enormous amount of money for a reasonable sized farmer if they were getting that kind of money for sequestering carbon, it would make it worth their while to switch very quickly. And not only to switch, but to keep improving their practices, getting their plant roots deeper, getting their, their, their food, in fact, so much more nutrient dense. And the relationship between carbon in the soil and nutrient density is very well established. So not, not only that, as Elaine said, we'd also be so stopping the water problem. In South Africa, they're looking at one of the biggest failed harvests they've had in decades because they've had half as much rain as they normally get in, in many areas. The result is farmers are saying we can't, we can't grow crops. In fact, that isn't true. They could grow crops if they had established the right soils because half the rain would still be enough. And that's really where we've got to go with this. So the, the, the ground cover would be there, the soil would be healthy, it would be able to absorb water, keep it in there, things wouldn't evaporate off as much, and it would just create a better environment. You know, I'm just, there's, there are layers and layers of goodness around this, because as there's more nutrition in the crops, and the roots get deeper, and it gets easier and easier to farm, uh, not only do we start seeing uh, alleviation of some of the healthcare crisis issues that we're having, we also deal with some of the food food shed issues and you know how are we going to fit, uh, feed 7 billion people and now we're actually uh, bringing big capital to deal with a global problem which is uh, climate change and all this carbon in the atmosphere by rewarding farmers to perform these types of tasks and actually farm healthier and, and better practices. So Molly, I mean, sounds like business is going to be booming for you. Um, what, what do we need to do to get this message out to more and more people? And who, do, who are the first people that need to hear this? I mean, yeah, I'll do it in my home garden, but you know, I don't got acreage. So how do we get this in front of the people that need to hear this uh, and, and take this message and really start implementing it um, on, their, on their earth? Well, I'd really like to thank you for inviting us here so that we can bring this knowledge to <clears throat> to your viewers. I think that it's a very important bridge that you're creating, Pedram, between people that are learning the, the nutrition world, understanding the human microbiome, and that the point that Elaine, Dr. Ingham, brought up about, well, where does that biology come from? It comes from the earth um, and your plants that you're, that you're consuming. So um, you're definitely at the forefront of that. I think this information needs to be brought in to elementary schools. It needs to be brought in to high schools and universities. There is a reason. Um, I think we had discussed this last time. A gentleman named Sir Albert Howard was writing about soil bacteria and fungi and all these organisms that we've been talking about under the umbrella term compost in the late 1800s. And then there was this long period of time where it was kind of ignored and pushed out of university settings. We have the resources to study this work. We absolutely do. So we need to start bringing it into education, um, first and foremost. Um, secondly, it needs to be brought into the agricultural realm. Um, Again, I, I bring up paradigm shift, right? Because our people that are practicing agriculture, 
in the last 70 years have been given a package, right? You apply this on this date and this on that date and you just keep doing that and then you'll have your crop. But when I go and I observe a farm, it's not like any other farm I've looked at. If I've seen one farm, I've seen one farm. So it becomes challenging. So we need to make sure that we're supporting our farmers with our finances if we have them and if we don't have them to support them with our energy or our gratitude or whatever, you guys are putting a lot of pressure on farmers to do this work. But ultimately, who's driving it? We are. So basic education in this knowledge and then for whoever's interested, we will offer advanced education. But basic principles apply all across the board. And it's pretty easy. Once you get the basic concepts of it, you don't really have to convince anybody. They want to know more because it makes sense, right? Because it's happening in our body. It's happening That's everywhere it. outside of us. You got millions of people eating organic food because it tastes better and they feel better, and they're going to Ryland's uh, restaurants, um, and that's you know kind of case in point. Uh, Ryland, you um, you had your hand up, so I want to make sure we, we get you there. Um, <laughs> uh, it's it's really important for us to understand that as the consumer, again, and I hate being called a consumer, but that's how we're seeing in the economy. We're driving a lot of this by our own sentiment. We're we're willing to spend our buck, right? And so if you're willing to invest in organic produce. And, and specifically invest in uh, farms that are practicing this. Now you're putting money into that farm, which is you know giving them more power to be supportive of this type of practice. So, what is your advice to us? We're running out of time here, but Rylan, what's your advice to us um, all as like individuals and consumers in how we can help make this transformation happen in our daily practices and purchases? Yeah, so um, what, I, what I raised my hand for earlier was just um, just some exciting things that are happening around the, the media that we created, the soil story. Uh, that, that We created that to be a giveaway and to be a part of a uh, educational curriculum that can be plugged into everybody from elementary school to, um, you know, college level to, uh, you know, into communications within the government. And we've we've had actually already five different versions of the soil story um, created in different languages. Um, we're actually hoping to get it in, you know, organic consumers associations helping us uh, translate it so we can have it in you know as many languages as possible. Um, and we actually the Los Angeles uh, Unified School District has seen the soil story and they want to bring that in as part of the curriculum. And then two weeks ago I connected with the San Diego School District and they're really excited about it. And then here in Paris, uh, the French school that I mentioned earlier that was is training, it's like a extended high school for uh, young people who want to become farmers. Uh, they actually, we, we made a French version of the soil story and they, they want to use that as part of their communication um, in, in, in that education platform. So that was what I wanted to share earlier. But your question was, um, you know how uh, how how can consumers drive this and make this transformation? And you know that really you know is what's happening because right now I know Costco has 30 percent in California, 30 percent of the products that they sell are organic, and they can't buy enough organic. Right now I think it's less than one percent of the acreage in the United States is being grown organically, and you know they the consumer demand it, you know. It it, it 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 is it is bigger than um, right now. I mean, there's almost more demand than there is um, you know food Supply. being produced. Yeah. Um, so there 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 basically needs to be an opening in a floodgate, and I'm hoping that in this whole uh, carbon conversation around sequestration, you know, this is going to some. It's going to open up the floodgates for. Um, as you know, to use Molly's word, a paradigm shift of that we can create an economic stimulus to have people who have been kind of holding on to their old model because it's kind of fear has them think that that's the only thing that's going to work. This new kind of stimulus for potential for you know not a second stream of income for not only for you know producing high quality food for your community or for the people, um, but you're actually able to get paid. Uh, for carbon that you're building into your soils, and you know there is a, a new NASA um, satellite that's able to 
you know, look a meter deep and, 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 and track water uh, in, in, you know, in the soil, which actually then can be, you know, developed so that you will actually be able to um, see what the carbon content on that exact plot of land. And if, you know, let's say that, you know, five acres over that plot of land, you just, you know, put the perimeter around how much carbon was there a year ago, how much carbon is there now, you know, that's an undeniable, uh, you know, retraction of carbon that came from here and now is down there. And, you know, that creates a way that we can stimulate and start paying farmers to, um, to sequester carbon. Um, so that's, that's very, very exciting and, um, and hopeful. Um, love it. Love it. We, I mean, we have promise now, right? There's, there's actual promise that uh, is helping us understand that, you know, we don't have to go down with this ship. We have a world. We can preserve things. I mean, don't go burning fossil fuels and start changing. I mean, this doesn't take away from the fact that we should transfer to renewable energy and all these other things. This is really an opportunity to undo some of the damage that was done and do so while, while feeding the world, building up the biosphere and helping. So there's, there's just so many layers to this that are fascinating and intriguing. So as a listener to this show, what would be, and I'm going to ask each of you quickly because we're just running out of time and I'll start with Elaine, what would be the action steps, just quick action steps that, that you would recommend people take listening to this to really be a part of this solution? Uh, Elaine, you're up. Um, as Molly suggested, start voting with your dollars. Um, support the farmers who are already doing this. Um, you know, go check out the Fair Carbon Exchange and see how you can support um, this conversion to a biologically uh, regenerative um, way of growing plants and providing food, um, reducing erosion, all of these problems, these layers that you're talking about. Uh, people have to start voting with their dollars. Love it, love it, and uh, we'll put up links for um, everything that we're mentioning here. Uh, Jimmy, what's your uh, what's your proposed solution here? Right, very similar, but I would suggest that uh, you go out and talk to people in the stores where you buy things. Tell them you're looking for better quality food, not only organic, but what evidence do they have that the non-organic food has got high nutrient density, has got high quality? because a lot of people can't afford organic. So I, I would say we need to put pressure on the retailers. Let them know that you want something better. Great, great, thank you for that. Molly? Um, I would suggest having conversations with people that are supplying you with whatever it is that you're buying. And begin thinking about closed loop systems. So when you take the trash out, what's in your trash? Where is it going? Was it necessary? How can we create a closed loop system so that everything is cycling through? Um, of course, I support all the other comments that were made. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, Rylan from Paris. Uh, yeah, so I also echo uh, voting with your dollars, you know, not only for um, food, but also clothing. Um, you know, I think, I think we, we we consume, we're seen as consumers because that's what we primarily do. I think we really want to look at what do we really need and why are we buying this and am I going to need this in six months and is this going to be in a landfill and yeah, really start only consuming and buying what you actually need um, and yeah, get to know the people who produce your food and find out why they do it and are they or do they do it because they love mother earth do they do it because they love soil do they do it and there are lots of people that do that and let's fund those people uh, and then start you know if you have if you have a little plot of land you know start touching the soil start being connected to growing your own food uh, start composting I've, uh, it's just been the greatest joy of my life. You know, I have a big life of, you know, running restaurants and all kinds of stuff, but, you know, I love more than all that stuff on Sundays in my garden, you know, or, or, or digging through my, my compost pile and finding that beautiful broken down, used to be food and now it's this beautiful black soil and I get to then put that on my garden again. I mean, it's like, there's nothing more fulfilling than that. So... Um, you know, those would be, and then obviously 
share, you know, uh, share the soil story, share, you know, the work of all these beautiful people here on this call, um, and 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 have people get the potential and the hope of this message. And that's why we created the soil story, so that people could have an aha moment about this great, beautiful potential that we're all speaking about. Love it. Well, we are committed to sharing this far and wide. I love the work that you all are doing. I think that this is really, really powerful. It's innovative, and it has a very uh, clear line, and it's a great promise for a, a better, sustainable future, and it's also really a way for us to kind of undo some of the things that we've done wrong in the past uh, without taking a huge hit. This is a very low threshold investment into fixing a very big problem on the planet, and so it's exciting. It's exciting. Um, you know, look, we're, we're here to support all of you. You guys are doing great work. Uh, if you're listening to this, uh, check out their work. We're going to put links in for all of this. We're going to share uh, the videos that we've been talking about and places you could get involved. And um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep pestering you guys. I'm going to keep following you around because this is this is good stuff. And uh, we encourage everyone to share it uh, widely with the people that they. Uh, that's it. It's all. It's all going to be on theurbanmonk.com. I want to thank you all for being here. I know you guys are busy, and um, keep up the good work. And hope to see you soon. I just wanted to have one last, one last comment, which was uh, the guy who trained all those farmers, or many of those farmers in South Africa, was a guy named Graham Sait, who was the original inspiration. Uh, I saw him, you know, maybe three or four years ago in New Zealand. That's the model that he really helped that Woolworth model uh, in South Africa get developed. So it's quite. I love the uh, synchronicity and interconnectedness that we all have. Oh, yeah. I worked with Graham for a long time. Yeah. I, that's Great. amazing. All right. Credit Wonderful. where it's due. Credit where it's due. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you all. This is uh, Dr. Pedram Shojai, uh, theurbanmonk.com, well.org. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you very much.